Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Eric Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. So what do you call four individuals who have spent their entire career in real estate and at least for 40 years they've been involved in the business? How do they look at the world today? You know, are we living in this dementia uh, that the world is getting so, so well that the land can be sold for such prices? Can rents be achieved all over? I don't know. That's why I brought together today these deans of real estate to provide their insight on the market. My guests, they include Josh Muss, who is the chairman of Muss Development, Joe Harbert, who's president for the Eastern Region at Colliers uh, International, uh, Robert Levine, who's chairman and CEO of RAL Companies, and last but never least, the kid from Brownsville, my friend Alan Goldman, who is the president of SJP Residential. So, the boy from Brooklyn, you know, I, now you weren't born in Brooklyn. Yes, I was born in Brooklyn okay, as so well. I, I know Musk, we're, we're not sure, you know, it could have been Russia. <laughs> the, the I have a story. It's an interesting I story. Okay, that. I know it's an issue, but I wasn't at the celebration <laughs> of the 100th anniversary. It's 2013. I still remember a couple of years ago when I would do a show, oh, these prices are so low. What's happened? These, it's like the Crazy 80 commercial. These prices are insane. Certainly are. Just remarkable in what has taken place, particularly in the last 18 months, that's driven prices, particularly for residential, to numbers that no one could have imagined. And certainly eclipsed what happened when we saw the height we thought the height of the market to be in 05, 06, uh, early 07. Uh, I think what you're seeing is is a, a combination of, of events that are coming together. Uh, very low interest rates, scarcity of product, and a lot of money chasing too little that's out there. And, and uh, people look at real estate whether you're a developer looking from an investor standpoint, you're saying, look at what people are willing to pay for condominiums. Notice what's happening though. Virtually no new rental other than uh, what uh, Lenny Litwin is building or maybe EQR. But for the most part, there's very little rental product being created here in New York. That's partly because the tax rates are so outrageously high for rental. You know, let's concur. You're building Oceana stage two. I mean, did you ever think of making that a rental? Um, actually, in Brooklyn, I'm not sure that the rentals work down south. Besides, the the community itself is all condominium, and uh, it didn't make sense for us to change the pattern. Um, but it wasn't easy to get our financing to do this next <coughs> development. 
uh, even though it was almost all sold out, or I should say 50% sold out before we even started the construction. Robert did a deal a number of years ago, one of the best in downtown Brooklyn, you know, one Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, it was before its time, as they said, and then the, the recession came in. Oceana was at the right time. I mean, when you can't have any successful properties in, like, the other parts of Brighton Beach or Coney Island, the Oceana is surviving and flourishing. Why? It's a beautiful development. It's a, I mean, it's just Forget a the development. No, okay. it, it, has the, it has the no, critical it, mass. It, it, has, it, has, it has substance. Oceana, the prices there never went down. They kept on the, the I mean, there are very few availabilities there. Uh, parents want their children to live there. Children want their parents to live there. It become a terrific community. It has access to the water. It has access. It has its own pool. It's indoor facilities. So it's a very unique product. It's very unique. But what? Why has downtown Brooklyn done so well? I mean, I mean, when you opened up, one Brooklyn Bridge was what? 2007, 2000. In 2007, we started pre-sales and all, and uh, you know the pre-sales were there. We were selling aggressively at substantial prices and then you know 2008 came along and of course you had the you know the people who then couldn't get financing couldn't close and you start all over again you know and the process begins so but you know as they would say in the trade a developer is like a junkie a <laughs> developer has to develop okay you can't live here you know that's what i always say and i i know that too well by spending too much time with alan at times you know he has to find the next deal the next deal now josh that's why sometimes okay. we get into trouble right but right. josh has always been josh has been the patient developer you know he found land you know finally he may even develop the, the grossinger property you know you know it maybe 50 years later okay you know, uh you know not there yet not <laughs> not, not there yet <laughs> but what do you are there opportunities out there today? Well, are there opportunities? I mean, that's a good question for all of us. I mean, we're all seeing properties being offered. The question is, you know, we're competing in a different arena than, than we did as, as the dinosaurs that are sitting here. You know, we had ingenuity. Only talk about yourself, dinosaur. Well, we had, you know, we had ingenuity. We had creativity. We had a passion for development as well. And we also, there was leadership. You know, and, and now, you know, what, what I find is, you know, listen, we're bidding on properties almost daily and we're spending a fortune in the analysis and the preparation of bids and, and preparing plans and whatnot just to, to see what really works. And then you're, you go into a bid and, you know, opposite you is a REIT or a fund or an analyst that just put a square foot number on a property saying that, you know, this is what I'm prepared to pay without a lot of the the history that comes along with a bid that we place. Yeah, here I have basically, you know, Josh owns a couple of office buildings and other properties, but here I have predominantly people who are in the residential with the exception of Joe. Joe is sitting here and, you know, the office market hasn't been that great. And Joe will tell you that the first three months of the year was what in New York City? They were so weak that if they continued at that rate, it would have been the worst year in 10 years. So what happened in April? A lot of pent-up demand. We see a lot of activity. Uh, there's more square feet leased in April in Manhattan than in the first three months of the year in total. Now, so now we're kind of back on track to have a better than average year. But here is my question. You know, we happen to have how many millions of square feet going into lower Manhattan at the Trade Center? We've got the Trade Center. We've got Hudson Yards. We've got yeah, all kinds of development. Right. So you have, you have those, and then you have the spec development, the 7 Bryan Park. Uh, you, you have, you know, you had your building at, uh, at uh, 11, 11 Times Square, which is pretty much leased up over here. But, you know, you still have a lot of properties, a lot of vacant properties over here. And how many people can be in Midtown South? It's a certain limited amount of space to be in the, near, near the meatpacking district of Google. Who's leasing? Are, are we getting, is the economy doing that well that people are renting or that people are leasing space today? Oh, yeah. We, we did a study of uh, who's become employed in New York in the last 10 years. And if you look at what's driving Midtown South, it's all of those industries that are growth industries, uh, which include publishing, Internet publishing, e-commerce, uh, what we call the tech sector. There's been employment growth in those sectors where we haven't seen employment growth over the last 10 years. Finance, investment banking, 
insurance, all of those have had net declines. And, and, of and the law despite firms, the fact I mean, that, and the know, law firms people. who were the biggest right. uh, leasers of space, <clears throat> they've reduced in size. They're yeah, generally right. speaking, law firms are about 10 or 12 percent of the market. Over the first quarter, they were 2 percent of the market. We saw a little comeback in April, though. Now, what That's do you, you have stuff. office market? How, how do you see your, I mean, you have the Brooklyn office market and you have the Queens market. Uh, how do you? Manhattan. We, we, actually, uh, we've seen a pretty good surge over the last couple of years, uh, the last couple of months, last year. So over the last several months, we've seen a surge of interest in leases. I'd say we did more leases in the last three months than we did in the last three years. Really? Yeah. Well, and and, what, about, and what about the concession? Uh, the amount of free rent? Well, you know, free rent is a fungible item. If you've been empty for a year, Another month or two won't make a difference. The banks want to see what you're getting Effective. as opposed to how, what your rent is. In other words, if I can get another 2 or $3 a square foot and give a free month, that's terrific. Now, relating to Joe's comment with regard to people moving in, these people need, need, need space to live. Yes, and they're, you know, they're filling. I mean, you look at downtown Brooklyn. All of the residential properties are, are booming, the rentals especially, you know, and, and that whole, you know, Flatbush Avenue corridor. It's been extraordinary. I mean, at one Brooklyn Bridge Park, we're, you know, we're down, I think we've got 15 units left. That's it. But that's, you know, one project. We're looking at many different opportunities in Brooklyn. But again, so, so the, where, where, the prices. Where, where, where are the opportunities? I mean, you know, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, Josh having a special type of product at the Oceana. There is still land in the development possibility in Coney Island, which people, I mean, Taconic has the property, you know, and some other people have property in, in Coney Island. Bushwick has become a, a, a possible space over here. Um, there are questions, I mean, uh, 1800 Park Avenue, uh, which was 125th Street and Park, which I've known intimately over the years. You know, now they say that Eichner bought that and he's building up in Harlem. Do you, where are the opportunities today for residential development? You, you and your son built a couple of years ago in Harlem on Third Avenue. Yeah, I, I think the problem is as follows: the cost of land, the cost of construction, the zoning, uh, and the and the demographics have inspired small apartments. And there are a lot of small apartments being built in downtown Brooklyn. Almost every apartment is small. Uh, very unusual to have two bedrooms. Uh, even in, in, in Harlem, they're building small apartments. I think that's good for the people coming into New York, the, the, the young and the famous, the rich and the, the, the empty nesters, the, the, the would-be college students who would like to uh, become part of the industry. But it's not, an, it's not terribly good for the, for the future families. And that's where the difficulty lies, because where there's space in the outer boroughs to build developments, the costs don't seem to work, and the banks are not lending for new construction. It's true. I mean, Alan, you, you're building on a, on a site that's been there for 45 years in Fort Lee. And what are you building? What kind of apartments? Are you, are you, are you following what Josh just said, a lot of small apartments? No, we're building a mix of apartments because uh, we believe our market, which is Bergen County, has really had a dearth of, of higher quality product uh, from a rental standpoint. But we want to be able to uh, really service a wide array of uh, uh, renters. So we have studios, and we have small ones and large one bedrooms. We have small two bedrooms and large two bedrooms, threes as well. So you need to have flexibility unless you've targeted, like if you were in the meatpacking district or somewhere where you knew it was basically kids coming right out of college, yeah, they don't want large apartments. They can't afford large apartments. But you have many families today who want to grow and raise their families in the city. That was not the case 10 or 15 years ago. And I agree with you that you need to have some family-based apartments, not just for singles. Your apartments at One Brooklyn Bridge were more, more geared to family. We had a real mix. We, we had a mix. But what has happened subsequently and over the the, the transition in the building is many, many people, and it's a, a substantial number, have purchased partner, apartments adjacent to them and done combinations as their families grew. And we had the same thing in Tribeca throughout a number of projects that we did in Tribeca. In Tribeca, it really is a family market, you know, truly. And the larger the apartments, the more they, they garner. I mean, we had apartments that we sold in the Franklin Tower in, uh, 
1999 that were four, you know, $4 million apartments then that were, were exceptional. And I just saw one on the market for 15.5. So that's the, uh, it's remarkable. For an average New York family. Yeah, right, and that's but, the but, point. But there was a, a comment before uh, when we were sitting in the green room. Uh, is Allen building office in Fort Lee? And Allen basically said there's no need for Fort Lee. And what, what's the New Jersey office market and the Westchester market? I think the Jersey market has never recovered from three recessions ago. I really think that, uh, you know, there is an interest <coughs> along the Gold Coast. People want to be a little closer to Manhattan. Some of SJP's yes. projects have been very successful doing that. And you'll see probably a little bit more development along the Gold Coast. Uh, Westchester is pretty quiet right now. Stanford's pretty quiet right now. You're seeing vacancy rates way up there. Uh, uh, despite that, there is some development in Stanford, both office and uh, residential. residential. A ton of residential south of the train station mm -hmm. in Stanford. And it's going to rent. Yes. A lot of rental. Uh, what I worry about long term is everybody wants to be in Manhattan. Everybody wants to be here. Everybody wants to be close. All these companies that are coming in or growing here, the tech companies, they want their employees to be nearby and the employees want to be nearby. So if we don't have affordable housing for these people long term, I worry about New York City. That's well, you know, the, the, we've been looking at a number of office properties in conjunction with the residential properties. And again, looking at older buildings for conversion or different things to, you know, for creative space, really dealing with the advertising agencies, the tech companies, the startups, and this transition that goes from, you know, desk space on to as they grow. And it's, very, it's a very interesting it's evolution. It is, yeah. Um, you know, but, and if you can tie it in with the housing, it's a great program, you know, that works. But, you know, these, these prospective office tenants are looking at, you know, uh, they want to come to work on their bicycles. You know, the building has to have the ability to provide space for that and storage and different things. And, I mean, we recently responded to an RFP in, uh, on the Empire stores in, in Brooklyn Bridge Park and made all of these provisions to do those kind of things. And it'll be interesting to see where we end up with that. But there's clearly a market. And then they're moving from Midtown South, you know, to they tried to come into Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan, you know, space that no longer is financial is getting absorbed by some of these it is advertising agencies. Downtown, yeah. But it's spreading out. If you, yeah. Wait, wait. You have a well, vacancy what? rate below 5% in, in Midtown South. So it's, it's coming up to the yeah. Garment Center. It's going over to Penn The Plus. Garment Center is doing better. It's no longer a Garment Center. There's no more Garment <laughs> yes, Industry. Yes, we call it Times Square South. Yes, we call it Times Square South. <laughs> Conversion of office buildings to residential is not an easy thing because of the loss factor. Do you right. see that happening? Well, it's, it's not an easy thing because of the loss factor. Right. You said it. You know, you go and buy an office building, and all of a sudden, you know, the, it's sold to you, and it's, you know, 550,000 square feet. When you do the conversion, it's 400,000. So there's 150,000 square feet you've lost. Right, like the, you know, AI, the AIG building, you know, where right, they're seven, intending to get rents of like $90 a square right. foot over there. You know, you know, they have a loss factor of probably 40% right. of it. So why there. don't they charge $120 a square foot? If they will, if they could. <laughs> they, they will, <laughs> and they probably okay. will. <laughs> but I did a show on the west side in the Hudson Yards. We're talking about a development of close to 9 million square feet on, on the Hudson Yards. A lot of it, most of it's office, but there's a lot of residential. What do you feel about that in the office market? And what do you feel about, you, you won't, I won't even, Hudson oh, Yards, I, you, I, do you I, know where that is? I, I don't know how the offices are going to be able to, even with the subway going there with the one stop, I don't understand how they're going to flourish the way they hope to. But companies are looking to right-size themselves, take big blocks of space, and the only way you do that is to move. And it's very enticing to move to new product that probably has some of this lifestyle you, attached to You know, to it. you and I were walking on the street last week. I caught you and we were talking about office space. I said, there's a lot of office space on 3rd Avenue. I, I don't know what's Sixth wrong. 6th Avenue too. Okay, 6th Avenue and 3rd Avenue have a lot of space. 6th yeah. Avenue is even nicer. Particular, yeah. Third Avenue, you can you can probably get space for forty five bucks, right? Well, you're getting Class A space in the fifties on Third Avenue. So I think the prices are relatively reasonable now. If you're look, if you're a tenant yes. and you don't want to be in Midtown South, and you want to be in good space, you can go to Sixth Avenue for sixty five dollars a foot. Those are pretty reasonable Wait a rents. I remember they're not ninety five, which they were. Wait a second. I remember that's exactly right. In two thousand and seven, there were people coming on my show and saying, "Oh, you know, I want that vacant building because I'm going to get one hundred and twenty dollars a foot." Today, you're and talking to me about Avenue of the Americas, nice buildings. We were, we're talking about $50, $60 a foot with good concessions and everything else. They're not around to come on to your show anymore. 
I'm not <laughs> saying. Some of them are no longer around, but some of them have survived. Now, what about Long Island City? I mean, you, you've always looked into we've tertiary looked. areas. We've looked. And we've looked, listen, we've looked at everything, and we continue to look at everything. You know, I was not comfortable, personally, with Long Island City. You know, I, I mentioned earlier when we, when we were sitting and talking, a lot of, the, you know, a lot of the properties we look at now and that we've looked at over the past couple of years, I have difficulty accepting or even looking at and rationalizing the prices. So I defer to some of the people in my organization now. Because having grown up in New York City, when I go to the Lower East Side and I see a building being offered for $600 a square foot, I remember walking down that street after getting a sandwich at Katz's and saying, you know, this was, you couldn't even get to your car. Or the meatpacking district is the same thing. You know, so, you know, you have to look at things differently. But, but I think Josh and maybe Alan brought up important comments. You know, first of all, it's, it's wonderful to have this environment of wonderful, uh, happy days are here again. But if we don't have housing, affordable housing for working people, we can't run this city. Well, I mean, that's the biggest problem. The I, rentals I, I, are precluded because of the land cost and the taxes. If the city doesn't in, in, implement another program to deal with the tax abatement for rentals, you're not going to see rentals because it's just not practical. The other problem then becomes if you're building for sale product, it's the financing. And the financing becomes an issue. And in many of these cases, a lot of projects, you know, that are, are acquired, nobody thinks about that up front. They just think about acquiring the property. And it's two, two of the most the, important uh, programs for middle income housing have disappeared. One of them is the 421B and, mm -hmm. and where uh, private houses in Staten Island, which created a tremendous boom, <laughs> has disappeared, and the other for 421A for apartment buildings. Uh, there are areas where they were eliminated, which never have seen development over the last 10 years, because everybody is looking at the prosperity in Manhattan and say developers don't need abatements. Well, the fact of the matter is, is I think the city made a huge mistake getting rid of the 421A program, mm -hmm. and that's the single most uh, important reason why there's a dearth of new development. Absolutely. There's a rental. Uh, we, we are, New York City is a city of renters for the most part, yeah. large number. They've tried to create, you know, ownership in condos, but still we have historically and still have a great demand for rental product, but there's very little being built. The 421A program was something that was so valuable to everyone. It created Tens of thousands of affordable housing units created new uh, rateables in the city, provided a whole array of product. And if you look at the history of what that program was from the 70s on through to 2008, it was, it's a disaster today that you are unable to develop it's any it's new being rental used. Product. It's being used to subsidize luxury buildings in Manhattan by putting in several affordable housing units, which based upon the community standards is high rent for the boroughs. Yeah, but those, those units that were developed as a result of 420 A were responsible for the redevelopment uh, of areas of the city absolutely. that were badly Link, in need the of The west it. side would have not been redeveloped if we didn't right. have the 421 A's right. in the redevelopment. You know, and, I, and I've brought this up before, it's in Lower Manhattan that both of you can understand even better. If we didn't have the 421 G's, we had office space in Lower Manhattan, which right. we still have office space now that nobody wants to move into, that we have buildings that aren't leased, okay? Right. And as you said before, I can't take a building and, and lose 30% and convert it. But if you took the building and you gave a tax credit to convert it, then developers would do things. Correct. Absolutely. That was the key. That's how, that was the stimulus for many of these properties. And that was it. It's gone. But we have to create development over here in the city. Well, I don't, I don't think the future is too bright because all the new mayoral candidates are trying to show why developers shouldn't get any subsidies at all. And in some instances, they're, they're appro appropriate, but they're whitewashing all potential development which may make profits, God forbid, to developers. Uh, but he, here's the, your bigger problem on that is the situation that with, with 12 years under Mayor Mike, he didn't know anybody anything, so he didn't have to 
placate any developers or anything else. It's still you, you, okay, you, and it, nothing happened. But yeah. right now, you have people over here who have different uh, agendas, and we have a difficult time. Well, and unfortunately, real estate has been the piggy bank of the yeah. city's financial needs, and and uh, they feel they can uh, take what's needed in order to spread it for other purposes. And I'm not saying there aren't other needs uh, that are there, but they need to look at a structure that has an understanding of the importance of affordable housing, of new development, uh, and without that, you're not going to see any new development. But part, you know, if you, if you look at the Azure, you know, which was done by Matone and Dematis, uh, and you look at the other one that um, Worldwide is doing, part of it is, you know, they're trying to take space and also put in educational facilities sure. so they're able to build schools, okay, because the schools are needed. In, the, in this situation. I mean, um, I, I, I look at the, the former site that Solo owned on First Avenue. You know, that, that's been vacant for years. That's even larger than the, uh, the Seward Park development yeah. site over there. But there's nothing, there are no amenities. I think he just sold off a picture yes. of that, right? He sold off one next to the public school yeah. Yeah. over there. Well, you know, there's been, an, you know, everybody looks at the, the outright rezonings as, you know, which were an impetus to a lot of development. But I think what the city failed to do with that is the zonings, and, and this is a whole different approach, but, you know, in other parts of the country, when you do a rezoning, there are exactions, or the current owner or the, the, the person it's conveyed to basically pays some, there's some value associated with that. When he gets an increase in, in, the, in the zoning, he, re he reciprocates and makes some kind of payment or something for that. You know, and that's what really was lacking in all of this because certain people had windfalls. Then you, you brought the prices up on real estate and everything around it, and there is no ability then to, to have affordable housing in those components. Yes, yeah, so you say you have 20% affordable. You know, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. Right. And not only that, affordable, the euphemism for low-income housing, and much of it is, but where is the middle-income housing? That's the problem. That's what's missing. For I mean, the guys we who are need. making and middle income in New York City is somewhere between $50,000, $150,000 a year. There's no housing for these people. That's right. What happens is, I think you put it exactly correct, there is the low income and then there's the high income. The middle income is gone and, and just try to get an apartment on the lottery when they build a, a mm -hmm. unit, they get uh, for 400 units, they'll get 14,000 uh, applications. So. Um, Hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that the world seems getting better, but we have a lot of potential risks out there. And uh, as Mr. Levine said, the dinosaurs uh, have to get a little um, easier and allow the... I'm looking it, for my next 25-year development. Okay, your next one. <laughs> Bushwick. Okay, Bushwick. So I'd, I'd like to thank my friend Josh Muss, Joe Harbert, Robert Levine, and uh, what's his name? Alan Goldman. And I'll see you next week. Thanks.